All right. How Bethesda doomed the future of Fallout from Dr. Skipper. This video comes highly recommended from multiple people in chat. You guys are saying that this does a really good job of breaking down the situation. And you guys know me. I love to discuss our discuss. It's a little Freudian slip. Discuss our Todd. I love to discuss our Lord and Savior, God Howard. Praise be. I need everybody in the chat to say praise be to Todd. May he guide us in paths of 7 out of 10 gameplay and creation club microtransactions that are totally not microtransactions and are actually totally just mods that you support through money. Granted, it sounds like paid mods. It sounds like microtransactions, but it's not. It's totally a different thing. You know, we also have to get dressed in the proper garb to honor Todd. This is the coat that Todd wore on stage six years ago to announce the Elder Scrolls 6, Fallout 76, Starfield, all of that stuff. I'm going to wear it for probably two minutes and then I'm going to start sweating so profusely I have to take it off, okay? I bought this to wear during the Starfield critique and it took so long that it just got here uh, like a couple weeks ago. So I've just had this in my coat like a dummy. Um, yeah, it still has the tag on. Let me see. Okay, anyway, this isn't interesting content. I'll take the tag off. But yeah, it's a nice jacket. It's a nice jacket. It's just, it was going to be really funny in that video. And now I just, now I just have this jacket. Okay, anyway, anyway, let's watch this video on Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Ripping the band-aid off, Bethesda is ruining Fallout. By saying this, a lot of you just went, yeah, and the sky is blue, while the majority of others just went, erm, what are you talking about? Have you seen the overall sales and recent Steam charts and recent popularity? So, to explain what I'm saying, I need to acknowledge that at one point in time, Bethesda saved Fallout. When the company Interplay slash Black Isle that made the first two games went bankrupt, Bethesda took the IP under its wing and created Fallout 3, which was a lot of people's entry to the series. Then in 2015, it happened again on the PS4 and Xbox One with Fallout 4, bringing an entire new generation to something even more accessible than Fallout 3, which was even more accessible than Fallout 2. And then later you got to watch a bunch of fun videos about Fallout 76. And now in 2024, a new Fallout TV show has boosted up all the games and brought people who didn't even play video games to Fallout. Fallout in general is popular, but is now only so popular due to momentum. The momentum of a new show, but when that dust settled, what was revealed is now a big wasteland. Ironically, a wasteland for Fallout. So despite the big numbers and everyone playing the games again, Bethesda is still ruining Fallout right now, in real time. Not because they made games that some people don't like, but even more cynical reasons. Greed, jealousy, entitlement. All behind the coddling of laziness, pride, and hypocrisy. Defended by the veil of success, love, and validation. And if someone doesn't interfere Ooh. soon, the IP will be consumed by the sands of the wasteland. So let's go down this rabbit hole of why Bethesda is ruining Fallout. It's a fair question to, and I'm glad he referenced the fact that by some metrics, it's actually doing the opposite. By some metrics, like player counts for Fallout 76 and stuff, you could look at it and be like, wow, Fallout's bigger than it ever has been. They're making more money. And like, this is the thing that Todd will do with, he did it with Starfield all the time where people are like, so there were some mixed reactions to Starfield. What did you think about that? Immediately pivots to, well, we, you know, have more players than we've ever had on any game we've ever released. Granted, it's through Game Pass, but more players than ever. We have more people playing for longer. Our, our average play time is longer than ever before. So we're really happy with the performance. And it makes people like me pause and go like, wait, so is like, are these games actually bad or is it just a bubble that likes to bash it, but they're still really successful in the same way that like you can have a celebrity that uh, like a Taylor Swift or a Justin Bieber or somebody that like a lot of people dislike very openly, but they still are wildly successful and clearly at the top of their game. Like, is that the situation we're dealing with where Bethesda Game Studios is like, you know, the the Taylor Swift or Justin Bieber of the industry where they're printing money, they're amazingly successful, but a lot of people see them as illegitimate or, or bad, you know? I'm, I'm not sure exactly where it breaks down, but I'm sure he's going to discuss it. My initial opinion, though, is just that I think that Bethesda Games are popular with a certain crowd that doesn't take the game super, super seriously. But I think it's also pretty clear that public sentiment has turned against Bethesda 
And that's reflected in all of these countless videos and the streamers that talk about it and the review scores and all that. People view Bethesda Game Studios as like a formerly great developer that now is just kind of struggling to keep up with the times. And so while they may still play the games, it doesn't necessarily mean that they consider the games as good as they used to be. But anyway. Also subscribe. Todd said that if we get enough of these, we might get a new Vegas too. I, I promise. That's what he said. Fallout's never been more popular. Min, 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 Which is why we don't have anything scheduled. Incompetent. Let me ask a question. Who is the face of Activision? Who is the face of EA? Who is the face of Blizzard that isn't in jail? Yes, yes, it's Luka Doncic, you're all correct. Most game companies are ran by shadow people who stack billions and billions while sucking the blood of children. But then there's studios where the main character is the guy you just want to sit down with and have a beautiful cup of coffee. Miyazaki, Hideo Kojima, Gabe Newell when he used to make video games instead of spamming out Steam sales so that he could go on vacation. Also, I think the TF2 community is pretty unhappy with him. And up there is cute little Todd Howard. Behind that leather jacket and false promises is an awkward hunk of love. And it's just a decoy for the real shadow people behind him. Todd is a guy that can constantly make bad decisions, but when you see him in the flesh, you kind of feel bad for the guy because he's just a little dork. If you want an example of this, look at when he got scared at IGN and didn't believe that the Fallout show was a 9 of 10 at first. Because before that, everyone loved his passion project for two weeks before ripping it to shreds and putting him back in the bad boy corner again. I believe that Todd Howard was once a great game director. He had that humble Mike Wazowski background. A guy who was persistent and had to work hard to get to where he is. He was turned down for Bethesda and told to finish school first. Where he then finished school and got told to kick rocks because there's no more jobs available. And after persistence, he finally got to work at the company and climbed his way up the ranks. He failed and succeeded multiple times. But as as we've now seen through the years that once humble Michael Scott has now turned to Mr. O'Hare. The irritating thing about <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was like, the Mike Wazowski impress that's actually pretty solid because he does have that just kind of oh vibe, you know? Where you just I don't know. People people frame Todd as like, you know, an evil mastermind, but he just doesn't have that vibe, you know? He just doesn't. I do think he's maybe just really good at presenting himself in a certain way because he's a salesman but there is no way you can look at some of the stuff that happened with like say fallout 76 and not end up concluding that he was very involved in some of those catastrophic decisions if not all of them because he runs the studio he knew how bad fallout 76 was he knew that all of these like uh, the, the secondary marketing stuff was going to be a disaster. He knew all of that stuff and he could have fought it more. He could have stepped in by all accounts. He had a really good rapport with Robert Altman, the CEO of Zenimax, the head honcho. If he wanted to call him and be like, we have to delay fallout 76, he could have done that. And he chose not to. And to this day, he's like said, well, we got some really fair feedback. So there, so we're going to do better. And it's like, that's a weird apology, man. You're just like, yeah, we got feedback. We can do better. We can grow. But you're not like, yeah, we basically stole your money. Sorry. <laughs> like there, There's just not really a lot of acknowledgement uh, for it. Yeah. Uh, my, my impression of Todd is that he's just, he is a, a very talented salesman. He's very charismatic and he can make somebody love him even when he's doing things that are objectively bad for for the customer or for the fan base todd and bethesda is that they're also the luckiest game developers of all time they're the only studio that constantly gets bailed out of mediocrity having it be swept under the rug and i used to think this is only a recent bethesda thing but with hindsight observation this has always happened valve games have stood the test of time from groundbreaking mechanics and innovation with the biggest critique being that they don't make games anymore because of the success of steam and in the case of tf2 recently value monetization more than their current online games but as we saw recently with a game like Half-Life Alex, Valve still makes games when they want to innovate and push new technologies. Bethesda is not Valve. They are constantly being bested by other studios and have no competition which has made them incredibly stubborn and borderline delusional. Bethesda in their prime was a hungry and driven game studio, wanting to make the best action adventure games with some of those old RPG elements. Elder Scrolls was an original IP that was constantly evolving. Daggerfall, Morrowind, Oblivion, with Oblivion being a big step up from Morrowind. While Bethesda was going on this run, Interplay's role-playing games like Baldur's Gate and Fallout were collecting dust. Since gaming was evolving, and Interplay saw no profitability making look-down-in-depth RPG games, it then comes in a savior, Todd Howard, who-
Yeah, baby. And Robert with his big checkbook. I think just a part of the problem, though, with BGS that you can't ignore is not just like they get bailed out by modders and stuff, which they do. But there is like a, a weird thing with the community, with the fan base that refuses to hold their feet to the fire. Even with Starfield, like acknowledgement of criticism is is anathema. They don't acknowledge it. They don't talk about it. It's weird. And even now, like Todd will only really go on friendly territory he'll go on somebody like you know a maddie's channel or he'll go on to talk with greg miller to 45 people and they get pitched softballs and occasionally there might be one or two good questions that todd dances around but there's never any follow-up or hard pushback to all of this and i don't think it actually helps bethesda because i really do think that todd and his merry band of devs are in a bubble they don't look at critical feedback they don't see any of that and it's just weird. It's just weird. I think that they, they, it doesn't help them to just ignore the critical feedback. That's my perspective. And ignoring it actively harms future projects because then you end up with the same design mistakes being made from release to release to release to release. He likes the look of Fallout and the aesthetic of Fallout and said by him himself, if this thing's just gonna collect dust, let me play with it. A bunch of the people who run the company knew the people at Interplay and we, we pestered him and pestered him. Like, are you guys using Fallout? They weren't doing anything with it. Keep this clip saved in the back of your brain because it's really funny with hindsight. I love those dear hearts. Fallout 3 is the Archduke assassination of Bethesda, being the first domino to what's wrong with them now. But at the time, this looked like the beginning of a money glitch. After getting the IP, Fallout 3 was made from the imagination of Bethesda, then quickly became the studio's most successful game ever. Gamers loved the exploration, the VAT system, and the gore. To the mainstream, it was the first ever post-apocalyptic game in the accessible format. It was a world that you could get distracted in for hours that had this illusion of choice and scale. It wasn't intimidating or unappealing to the masses like the first two Fallout games, but there was objectively a lack of quality in its RPG elements. Fallout 1 and 2 are real RPG games, and that was the main appeal of Fallout before Bethesda took over, where then Fallout became a more linear RPG, more fascinated with exploration and action. So that created a vocal critique to Bethesda, which at the time was tossing a stone at the guy who ruled the world. Fallout had a monopoly on the RPG genre. When people weren't playing Halo 3 for multiplayer or Gears of War, they were playing Fallout 3 for their single player itch. Not many knew the quality of a game like Fallout 2, so who cares if Fallout 3 is linear and poorly written? It's the only game I've played, and with no competition, it's fun to use vats and explore the wasteland. And people loved it. Bethesda was revered and Todd Howard was a new god. So Todd sat down and thought to himself, let's make Fallout 3, but in Elder Scrolls. And ZeniMax didn't like that. Fallout was a hit, so why go off the grid and make a game and have the IP collect dust? And luckily, there was people who wanted to make a Fallout game and had some experience with the IP. Originally, an expansion was going to get outsourced for Fallout 3 while Skyrim was being made, but Todd Howard convinced ZeniMax to make an entire new Fallout game made by Obsidian Entertainment, which was a studio that had a lot yeah, of yeah. people that previously worked for Interplay and were on the development team for Fallout 2. New Vegas was made from the skeleton of Interplay's Fallout 3 that was scrapped due to the company's financial struggle. And before New Vegas, they made Knights of the Old Republic too. That was rushed, so they didn't have time to fully scale that game to their vision, but still pulled it off. Luckily, that will never happen again, right? Yeah. In New Vegas, 18 months. That's how long it took. 18 months, and they threw it together. That's wild. It's wild. And there's some debate. I'm not sure what his sources are for the Fallout New Vegas backstory. There were talks of an expansion being made. My understanding, and I, again, I'd love to be wrong, so I'd love to see if he has sources or anything listed um no it doesn't look like it but my my understanding is that todd initially offered a good amount of resistance to the idea of giving the franchise away to another developer um after just acquiring it it was more of a an executive choice that might be wrong maybe there's an interview or something where one of the executives says no it actually was todd's idea maybe i don't i haven't seen that and I've, I've looked at this a lot, but maybe, maybe that is the case, but I know now they're trying to like kind of retcon it and they're like, Oh, Todd, Todd says all the time. Well, we published new Vegas. So that's still basically one of our games, which is like a weird way to, to try and retroactively claim credit for it. But anyway, <laughs> that's just everything. Yippee, there'll be no wedding bells.
Behind the minds of Josh Sawyer, John Gonzalez, Chris Avalone, Fergus Urquhart, and many more came Fallout New Vegas, a game made for the in-between period of Skyrim with an 18-month window. This game even existing is not only impressive, but also displays the massive problem with Bethesda. Obsidian's tight deadlines show that even under pressure, if you could write something good and really love what you're making, that everything else will fall into place. And the stuff that doesn't fall into place will be viewed forever with the lens of, what would this game be like if they had three years to make it? New Vegas is made with the consideration of Fallout dude. 3. The developers even say that the Fallout 3 formula is why the mainstream enjoy Fallout. So instead of discarding Bethesda's format and game style, their goal was to improve everything from the third game and build upon it with the limited time they had. Gunplay, customization, skill trees, roleplay, writing, Fallout New Vegas is a collaboration of Fallout 2 and 3. Taking the care of fun and roleplay from Black Isle and collaborating with the fun and wonder of Bethesda, New Vegas is a true gem that mastered the Fallout style, becoming the poster boy of what an RPG should be, and it wasn't even made to its full potential due to the crunch and tight deadline. There's so many video essays and breakdowns you can watch going over the incredible details of New Vegas, but even playing it for yourself and committing to it, you will quickly see that New Vegas is a game that has never been replicated again. Because instead of choosing to be pretty and shiny on the outside, they instead chose to be shiny and pretty on the inside, which is why Bethesda hates this game. Yeah, they've always been really weird about it. I've tried to find interviews. We even did it for a video maybe like a year ago where I went back and I looked at every interview I could possibly find where Todd and other BGS execs talked about New Vegas. And it's morphed over time. Initially, they were just like, yeah, no, we're glad the fans are happy with it. And they just don't really like talking about it. But then later on, specifically around like the talk of the show's success, Todd started pivoting. And like just back in April and May during the show's hype, Todd shifted and was like, oh, well, we published Fallout New Vegas. So we were very involved. So it's not really just Obsidian's success. You know, we we were very involved with that and basically trying to say we're part of the reason the game was really good. So if people are like, oh, just give for, like Obsidian Fallout, that's not going to do it because we were also involved. So we're part of the reason. So you're not getting away from us. You know, it, it's just kind of weird that they've tried to pivot like that. But there's always been something weird about Todd's approach and reaction to new vegas there's just always been something off and the way i've described it previously is like if there's an older brother and a younger brother and the older brother has worked really really hard to like get through high school and uh maybe he went to like community college and he's working in like a solid it job making pretty good money but then his younger brother comes in, gets full ride scholarships, goes to Harvard, is a lawyer and is running for Congress at age 28. The older brother is like, well, I did good and I'm proud of what I've done, but my younger brother, everybody can't stop gushing about how amazing he is and how successful he is and all this. And I kind of, I kind of resent him. You know, that's kind of the approach where, where Todd and BGS are the older brother and the younger brother is Obsidian. And they're like, well, we've, we've had some success, but also like, screw you guys. You know, it's, there's just some, maybe jealousy or something like that going on. It's odd. It's really weird. Um, thank you, by the way, Loop, for, uh, for subbing with Prime over on Twitch. Thank you, my friend. Booyah. With the revisionism of the Fallout fanbase, some are attempting to rewrite history and gaslight the narrative around New Vegas. That Todd doesn't hate the game, that he actually loves the game, that all Fallouts are masterpieces in their own way. And while the idea of holding hands and singing Kumbaya around the fire is beautiful and brings a single tear to my eye, I live in a place called reality, where we don't always shed a single tear at every rainbow. Todd has recently praised New Vegas. It would make sense that after 14 years, he would now praise the game in the spotlight, since he's using its identity as his new meat puppet to make people get excited after years of downplaying it. The I'm also just like, look how actually empty the waste looks like around New Vegas. But man, that's part of the reason why it would make so much sense to do a remake. Give it to an Obsidian. Dear God, don't give it to BGS. But give it to somebody who knows what they're doing with remakes. Remake New Vegas. Get rid of the weird walls between districts. Be so good before season two. The creator of New Vegas has stated, I don't feel like it's healthy for me to be really invested in something I have no control over. This was after he was asked about Fallout New Vegas' role in the Fallout show. Also, the writer of New Vegas is not happy about certain decisions that have been made and has been vocally critiquing the show as well. So to state that there's a two-way street yeah. of friendship and respect just makes no sense. Obsidian has been getting screwed over by Bethesda for a while. Because of the big crunch, New Vegas was insanely buggy at launch and had trouble running on that current generation's hardware. If only had an extra year like 
Starfield to patch bugs because that was clearly the only problem that game had. So because of this rough launch, its critic scores were affected, which put them one point below the required score to get their bonus. Yes, the bonus for the team that crunched this game in 18 months was in the hands of subjective reviewers that didn't get to meet the bonus requirement due to the rush launch that made it lower in scores. It's almost like the game was rigged from the start. So yeah, fuck. I mean, I, I understand that this is a common talking point and I will fully agree, I think, obsidian probably deserved more money than whatever they got for new vegas because it was very good wildly impressive it got done in 18 months that being said when you sign a contract for like putting on a, a game and, and putting it together and you know you have to meet this threshold and hit this threshold for your bonus like you signed the contract you didn't hit the score so you don't get the bonus like i've never i've never found that to be like the big smoking gun for how evil bgs is that that some people point it to be like i just like yeah they didn't hit it it sucks but the game was also like super freaking broke broken at launch and i understand why because they rushed it they didn't have time to get it polished up i totally understand that but it's also like that was the deal that was the deal you know it's just I don't know, i've never i've never thought that that was a fair point to like demonize bgs there's plenty to demonize demonize them over you guys know me i have no problem with demonizing pgs and some of the people involved with their stuff but this i've always found to be unconvincing that bonus the game didn't get as high of scores as fallout 3 but the noise and praise were higher than fallout 3 for sure the vast details and choice in new vegas made fallout 3 its bitch a real rpg a game where you could actually carve out your destiny a game with real consequences and choices while also being a more in-depth fun shooter new vegas quickly became the poster child for what a video game should be and its humble roots even made it more beloved in history what these guys did in 18 months most people can't even do today with four years i like cyberpunk as well but like jesus imagine that budget and time in these guys hands with the success there was a change in todd the little nerd who loved video games got angry he got bitter he stuck his neck out for this thing to be made he originally wanted interplay to share the ip so that bethesda could have fun well now he did the same thing back and got upstaged then after this todd released skyrim and it became the biggest game of all time sure did. Skyrim was the peak of Bethesda style. Skyrim scaled back even more from Fallout 3 in terms of roleplay and doubled down on the vision of being an action RPG. And in the result of that, Skyrim was a huge success. It's weird looking at Skyrim from a modern viewpoint because while Skyrim truly changed gaming, Bethesda also learned all the wrong lessons from its success. Skyrim is a really bad RPG, especially compared to KOTOR, KOTOR 2, New Vegas, but it was the spark of action adventure games. At the time, Yeah, I think it's very important for people to understand what BGS games are they're not narrative rpgs and they haven't been probably ever honestly what they make I, i've i and some other people have called like a sandbox rpgs they are games where you run through big open worlds and you just kind of do whatever you want and you don't take it that seriously just like a toddler playing in a sandbox you just don't really think about it too hard because it'll hurt your brain and you just you have fun you know, you just have fun. You don't stress it. New Vegas was a narrative RPG while also doing the other stuff that BGS did in Fallout 3. And it was very, very well received because of that, because a lot of those narrative RPG fans don't often get a really good fix. And I think some people, especially after New Vegas, started to try and hold BGS's feet to that same fire. Be like, why aren't you making uh, narrative RPGs? And like, well, it's just because we don't really do that. So Skyrim comes out not really a narrative rpg at all very lighthearted. it's a junk food game don't take it that seriously you're not going to get any real sustenance from it fallout 4 comes out similar story but they started pretending like they were a super serious narrative company and i think most of that lands at emil's feet and i'm guessing he's going to bring up emil because i don't think you can uh i don't think you can get away from him <laughs> Time Skyrim was a lot of people's first time ever really feeling like they were in a fantasy world that they could explore and be powerful in, similar to how people felt with Fallout 3. Nowadays, the combat is jank, the skill tree is overpowered, making you a god with no consequence, and yeah, the RPG is down to pick A or B side and eventually everything falls into place. But compared to Fallout 3, New Vegas, and even Red Dead 1 to an extent, it was magical, pretty, and huge. I quoted this from Joseph Anderson in my Starfield video, but Skyrim is a shallow puddle, but it's just so much fun to splash in. I look at Skyrim with cynicism now, because as good as Skyrim 
Skyrim was, it's aged and everybody has done something better than that game since. Skyrim was way more successful and popular than Red Dead 1, but Rockstar ended up making Red Dead 2, which some say is the most immersive open world game of all time. That Dark Souls game that came out in 2011, yeah, that studio made Elden Ring. The point is that there's been a lot of evolution in gaming since then. And while studios have been upping their A game, Bethesda has been on nothing but a downfall. After the success of Skyrim, Bethesda got an ego. Todd made the most successful game ever by doubling down on what people said he was doing wrong after the comparison of New Vegas and Fallout 3. So he was going to do what he did before again and trust his gut. He was going to bring that Skyrim mindset to Fallout again, scale back even more on that RPG element and get even more linear. They're going to stay on the same engine. They're going to do... Yeah, I think what he just said is pretty profound that Skyrim popped off after doubling down on the things people gave him crap for in Fallout 3. And so he's like, okay, well, watch me now. And just keep kept doubling down and just doing whatever he wanted to do. And I again, like Fallout 4, I think is a fine game. A lot of the problems for BGS are just that they don't know how to frame things. And I think Todd oversells stuff and accidentally over promises like framing fallout 4 as a narrative rpg with a really intense story more but like you know there's more lines recorded for dialogue there's more characters than ever before there's higher production value and cutscenes and stuff than ever before they push all this stuff and then you get the game and you're like oh but the narrative sucks so why did you make that the selling point now i think the game sucks even though the rest of the game is pretty solid as like an adventure game it's really good but because you sold it to me the wrong way it feels bad now you know it's like if you give somebody a, the keys to a car and you're like yep yeah, this car is actually watertight so you can take it and drive it in the ocean the wheels will spin basically as like a mini propeller as if that's how that works and you can actually use this car as a boat and then you take your car you drive it into the ocean and it sinks you're gonna get out and be like what the hell dude it didn't do what you said it was gonna do you promised this and you really failed to deliver and they're like okay yeah we're sorry you didn't like the the boat feature that didn't work but it's still a really good car and you're like well it's kind of too late my experience has been pretty significantly tainted as a result of this i can't I can't unwater it, you know, like you, you sold me on this one idea. And then when you failed to deliver that on that one idea, you pivot and try to go like, well, but the rest of it's good. And it's just, that's not how that works. What others can't. They're going to make a Bethesda game because Bethesda games are something no one else can make but Bethesda. Bethesda became secluded. Instead of spreading out and being charitable, giving people cracks at different visions under their IPs like they once did, they became a studio of doubling down on their independent visions. A huge complaint of New Vegas today is that it feels janky and old. And yeah, that's true. God willing, you will not leave this valley. It even felt old in 2010. And since New Vegas, Bethesda and Obsidian haven't collaborated. So Obsidian never got to make a more modern game, which also makes no sense. Even with Fallout New Vegas not selling as much as three, the game is still revered as the greatest RPG of all time and still sold well for- I mean, I would not call it the greatest RPG of all time, personally. And I don't know a lot of other people. Like the best Fallout game, yes. But the greatest RPG of all time, that's a pretty tall order, but, uh, but maybe it's just a matter of- but he said multiple people argue this. Selling as much as three, the game is still revered as the greatest RPG of all time and still- still revered by like maybe a couple people. I don't know, that's a stretch. Anyway. Well, for Bethesda standards. The gap between Skyrim and Fallout 4 would be from 2011 to 2015. In the timeline, Skyrim was just recently the biggest game ever. Bethesda had clout and cash, and now Bethesda had time. And between those four years was radio silence. Even from a business standpoint, it makes no sense. In the past, ZeniMax was asking for more Fallout when Fallout 3 was a success. So that's why New Vegas was on that crunch to chase that high which it did. And then after New Vegas, you have Skyrim being the biggest game ever. And being the biggest game ever is followed by no urgency or pursuit. It has to be because Obsidian didn't want to do it anymore, right? After that crunch and getting fucked over on that bonus, they were like, nah, let's not, let's not do it anymore. Nope. Chris Avalon, the writer for New Vegas, states that New Vegas 2 was pitched and denied. When asked why Bethesda said no, he said that that question has kept him awake at nights for years. And then states that the team repeatedly asked to do an Elder Scrolls spinoff in the style of Fallout New Vegas, or anything in the Fallout world world for years to then be told nope again. He even pitched it the same way. So this brings up Boogeyman claims of why Obsidian didn't work on anything for Bethesda. <laughs> Claim one, the game being buggy brought a negative reputation. I mean, I think we all know why. It, this in light of the recent interview that, that Todd did with, I think it was the one with Maddie, where he just said, I think it's okay for people to miss things. I thought that was very telling. Cause it's basically, I think it's okay if we spend a decade between Fallout games 
and we bring them something so they get super hyped over it. I think that's Todd's new approach is he, he will wait, spend lots of time working on something that you may or may not like, but it'll wait so long that by the time you finally see it, you're just so excited to get another fix that you don't really care what it's like because the hype will carry it across the finish line. I really think that's it. Like at this point, I think BGS games are not just sandbox games. They are games designed to try and hype up the fan base. And you saw it with Starfield. You saw a lot of people really disappointed about Starfield after they played it. And so I think that that's a, a big part of it. The game being buggy brought a negative reputation. This is bullshit. Yeah. Bethesda games have always had the reputation of being notoriously buggy. Yeah, Skyrim dude, had real. a buggy launch, and even years later, we'd see this again with Fallout 4 and 76. And even besides the bugs, we've seen a game like Starfield that was almost spotless still be disliked. It's a shadow claim that I don't believe. I mean, to be... I, maybe I'm just a bug magnet, but like... Starfield was the most polished game they'd ever released, but it was still pretty damn buggy. There were still a lot of issues. So I I don't know if I'd say it was damn near spotless, but the first 20 hours, first 25 hours, pretty spotless. But after that, man, man, not I, again, I would not go and say spotless wouldn't go that far. It objectively makes no sense. In ZeniMax's interest of making more money, they benefit by having more games to make more money. Fallout New Vegas was revered as one of the greatest games of all time, so it wouldn't even be a problem in terms of quality or care. And now you have a four-year window of nothing going on. And when you had this exact situation and worked the first time, New Vegas The Gap Game was a hit. Then Skyrim After was your biggest hit. For ZeniMax to now stop production at the high of Bethesda just makes no sense. It's why I know Bethesda had to intervene. Todd's ego of being a sore winner has now hoarded the Fallout IP and the Elder Scrolls IP. IP, making Bethesda the core developers of both from now on. I think Todd did this to avoid Obsidian making any more games. To avoid Obsidian making an Elder Scrolls New Vegas to their Skyrim, so it couldn't once again shit on their parade. But hey, if you're gonna be a goblin with your IPs, just don't mess it up. I think we all have a sneaking suspicion that Todd probably stepped in and tried to prevent them from doing it again. And again, it just reminds me of that interview where he's like, it's okay to miss things. I really think that that's a lot of it. I think, I think he really, really wanted uh, not new vegas to fail but i i think he he wants to be seen as the definitive developer of fallout and especially now that fallout's bigger than it ever has been i don't think he wants to give that baby to somebody else because you gotta remember i mean the, like this is the guy in charge of fallout games like he's the guy imagine being the person who is in charge of fallout games one of the biggest franchises right now in the world and he's just in charge of it he just gets to do what he wants to do with it that's a big deal that's big and uh, I, I can see why he might be protective of that. But I think it's it's also frustrating because, again, it's probably a decade before we see anything else. Russell Thander, thank you also for the super chat. Luke, is there any game you seriously want a sequel of? Like, I want a prototype three or at least a remaster of the originals. Great game uh, for its time. I would love to see a reboot of the Red Faction series with modern destruction tech probably more in line with like the very first game that's like very narrative heavy very dark and gritty but with the whole like you can blow your way through all sorts of different tunnels and work your way through levels and combat encounters that way i think there's all sorts of really cool things you could do with that so that's the first one that jumps out to me i think seeing them reboot something with red faction would be awesome four was a mixed win i brought this up problem with your ips just don't mess it up Fallout 4 was a mixed win. I brought this up in my Starfield video. Fallout 4 made it so that Fallout played more like a modern shooter that isn't from 2005. The gunplay was pretty ass compared to other games at the time, but it's still real gunplay. The world was fun to walk around. You're able to loot, craft, and explore. The plot was horrible, the world building was bad, and the RPG was the worst it's ever been. The launch was also buggy and everything releasing around it was way better. Once again, those assholes who made Dark Souls in 2011, yeah, they just made Bloodborne, you know, one of the greatest games of all time. Witcher 3 came out, also a really good game. But, besides all this, Fallout 4 sold well. It was the best launch for Bethesda ever, actually. Overall, Skyrim is still on top on sales, but in that small release window, Fallout 4 skyrocketed off of anticipation alone. The last Fallout game was five years prior, not including New Vegas, 7. But this is when Todd was flying too close to the sun, because in doing so, it regressed a lot from even Skyrim, which already regressed from previous games. It was too linear and dumb, without care outside of cosplay. So once again, like Fallout 3, it was on paper a success, selling 13.5 million copies, being the most successful in the Fallout series.
Fallout 76 was a colossal failure. The pride and lies of Todd catched up to him. He couldn't run from this one. Where New Vegas was a rush game made with love, Fallout 76 was a rush game made with greed. Like Elder Scrolls, instead of letting someone else ever try to upstage them again, they wanted to keep the IP alive via live service. They scanned people, made false promises, and years later tried to rewrite history. Because if something doesn't work at Bethesda, it's never a swing and a miss. It's just that people don't get it yet. Dude, and that's what drives me the most crazy is that it's like, again, in that interview with Todd, where he's like, some people liked our games. They liked, uh, they liked Starfield. Other people liked it less. It's like, no, Todd, they didn't like it. It's not that they liked it less. It's that they just didn't. <laughs> like, he can't even acknowledge that some people don't like his own games. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy. So after dropping the ball, what does Bethesda do? Do they finally give in, stop hoarding the IPs, and work on their next game, Starfield, while a new Elder Scrolls of Fallout gets co-developed? Nope. They announced their next Elder Scrolls game in 2018, then they don't release their next game till 2023, and then they start working on that game from 2018 after their 2023 game. And guess what? That 2023 game is outdated. It's worse in RPG mechanics from Fallout 4, and also worse in gameplay. Bethesda games can be enjoyed by people. That's okay. They're dumbed down to be accessible. But because they're so dumbed down, it makes them not great games so if their games are not amazing why the fuck are they gatekeeping them so hard from the time of fallout 4 to starfield from software released bloodborne bloodborne dlc dark souls 3 dark souls 3 dlc a dark souls 1 remake sekiro elden ring dlcs to both of those it's just fallout 4 was so old and shit and starfield was old and shit i know studios have a reputation of cracking the whip on developers but at least after those cracks and brutality you get a red dead redemption 2 or a halo 2 or even a new vegas yeah gta 6 took forever and it looks great and will most likely be amazing because Rockstar hasn't dropped the ball yet on their single player campaigns. So they have the right to go ghost mode and have it be okay because when they come back, you could trust it. Starfield is not a game that takes five years to make and that's being generous counting 76 that was made with tape and spit. Eight years to work on this piece of shit game? From Skyrim, it's been a downhill slope. Each game is getting worse and now you want us to be happy that Elder Scrolls 6 is getting made on that same old ass engine with a little bit of polish that still has the NPCs being dead on the inside. I have a video about Starfield, but Bethesda doesn't make good enough games to be this greedy. In 2021, Microsoft bought ZeniMax Media, so they own Bethesda as a publisher, even though Bethesda operates as its own studio. The purchase was for $7.5 billion. Now, Bethesda is owned by Microsoft. Starfield is a bomb. Your next Elder Scrolls game isn't going to be out for like another five. Well, again, we have to be accurate. Was Starfield a bomb? I think for Game Pass, no. It's hard to tell without their internal metrics, but we do know that the average player time uh, or average play time for Starfield, according to Todd, was about 40 hours. That's damn good, especially with how many millions of players they had jumping in that. It's why we have to be precise with this stuff because with streaming services, it's not about what people rate the game. It's about how much time they spent playing it. So for, Star or for Starfield, if that game comes out and it has an average critic score of like seven out of 10, if they're getting however many millions of hours played, it doesn't really matter. Like it, it really doesn't matter um, that the reviews weren't amazing because people still eat them up. Like they played it, they did the thing. Like that, that's all Game Pass is really about. It's getting you to pay a monthly subscription and spend hours on the service so that you get hooked on it. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. And so for Starfield to crank out lots of hours played, I think that's exactly what they wanted it to do. And so by that metric, it probably was considered a success. Even if it didn't sell great on like Steam, even if people refunded it, even if people reviewed it poorly after spending 40 hours in it, I think it still gave them the hours played they wanted. Um, didn't impact Game Pass subscriptions though, raised them 1%. Yeah, well, there's, I th as far as I can tell with Game Pass, there's kind of two types of projects that they're doing. For one, they have growth games and projects. And then they have games that are designed to crank out gameplay hours. And I think Starfield was a gameplay hour game. And they would, of course, loved for it to have been a growth game as well. But it evidently didn't end up being that. Maybe long term it will be. But if anything, I would guess that Fallout has been more of a long term growth thing with younger demographics than, than Starfield was. I think after the success of the show, you probably saw a lot more teens and 20 somethings signing up for Game Pass to play Fallout 4 for the first time than people signing up to play Starfield. That would be my my guess, though. Five years. So what the hell is happening with Fallout?
Fallout in the current conditions is truly screwed, but you don't think so because Todd gets lucky. He always gets lucky. The Fallout show came out and now Fallout is popular. Everyone was playing the games, getting that fix. Now 2015 is the new 2024. And now the West belongs to Todd. Now New Vegas, as an aesthetic, belongs to Todd. But where are the games? While everyone's sucking off Fallout 4 again, mind wiping the history of Fallout 76, acting like it's a great game now, it's surprising no one sat down and questioned for a second. Why hasn't there been a new RPG since like 2015? And as I've been breaking it down, it's because Bethesda is insecure and are sore winners, and they always get away with it. Even now, how flawed Fallout 4 is, they release a season of a show and all that history of Bethesda's pettiness is wiped away. The failure of Starfield is wiped away. Todd, you aren't a Kanye West album that everyone hates because they aren't ready for. You're a guy who constantly gets bailed out after wasting years making shitty video games while having IPs collect dust, like the CEO guy from Smiling Friends, because you fear that you will get upstaged by people who are better at making games than you, like what happened so long ago with Fallout New Vegas. The Fallout hype is now dead, and you aren't getting an Elder Scrolls game for five years. Then after that, they're gonna have to make a new engine because no way you could get away with it again. Hell, they might be doing that now and Elder Scrolls 6 might take like seven years. Then after nope, they confirm they're still using creation engine, so we're not getting away from that. After that, you're gonna have to wait for another Fallout game, which is gonna be like another five years. So eyeballing it, it's gonna take 12 years to get the next entry to Fallout, which will probably not be good because the head of this Bethesda ship is stubborn. Ecotism. Dude, and also just like Todd's an older gentleman. The dude's gonna be what? Like mid 60s on his way to 70s by the time fallout 5 comes out like jesus that's crazy that's wild but that's just what happens russell thank you for the super chat homie <clears throat> you can take the jacket off if you want it looks pretty uncomfortable i'm committed now that's the problem if i quit now i'm i'm a quitter i can't do that so i'm starting to sweat like a pig but we're close. We're close. And then we got the podcast here in a few. So I, I just, I got to push through. <laughs> <laughs> and lives off of doubling down on critiques against him to prove a point. While every other studio around him is doing better stuff, while this guy only relies on getting bailed out by fan revisionism. Even CD Projekt Red, after a crash and burn, still made a fun action adventure game that also has bad RPG. While Bethesda were making Starfield, though still has loading screens, dead planets, and outdated combat, while doubling down and arguing that people were wrong in Steam reviews. You may need to upgrade your PC for this game, but it's got a lot of great stuff going on in it, and the fans are responding awesome. <laughs> From 2015 to now, you could have had two four-year developed Fallout games on the same old-ass Fallout 4 engine and having them be hits because if New Vegas proved anything from 3, you can have both action, fun, and good stories. You don't only have to do one. And if something is great enough in concept, people will brush off its package. Bethesda is truly a gaming cancer. These are not the same guys who made Skyrim and the only reason people like Fallout 4 because nothing else has been released on that same engine besides an MMO to compare it to. Microsoft, you have proven to be a spineless, money-hungry company, so wake the fuck up. People like Fallout New Vegas as an in-between game was a success. I know they own Obsidian. It doesn't even have to be them. You can make a new team and rehire the competent people that were left to rot by Bethesda and make a new game. By doing that, people get a new game and you get money. Bethesda does not make good enough games to be such entitled pricks about their IPs, especially for one they didn't originally create, which is Fallout. Fallout 3 was made because it was people wanting to put a spin on something they enjoyed. And Bethesda gave the same gratitude back. And then when Obsidian did it better, they got insecure and wanted to prove that they make better video games. And I've not let anybody have access to that IP sense. Nobody wins. If you like Bethesda's Fallout games, you get no Fallout games by them being elitist. Microsoft, after forking $7 billion and having Fallout now be in the mainstream, gets no money. And Bethesda already knows this. They could have been doing something years ago. But keep releasing patches nine years later that breaks every mod. Keep getting outclassed by modders making passion projects. End of the day, they're winning. They get to play with the meat puppet of something created with love while never sharing again themselves. And they get to be revered for it. I have no love for Bethesda. I think Bethesda sucks and the only way for that company to survive is to get rid of that upper office. But Microsoft is incompetent, so most likely nothing will happen, and we will continue the Bethesda cycle where the next Elder Scrolls gets a reality check when a lot of people don't like it, and Microsoft realizes that the hood has moved on to FromSoft games. And hopefully they make a change then. But let's be honest. <laughs> There's like 15 different references to, <laughs> to FromSoft. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a sneaking suspicion that those are his favorites. They probably won't. Yeah, I, I mean, I think mainly my main takeaway from the 20 minute video, which well edited, well voiced, well scripted, all that. It was a good video. Go again, hop over to uh, to Dr. Skipper, give him a sub. My main takeaway is just at the very end, Bethesda doesn't make good enough games to justify being such pricks with their franchises and stuff. And I think that's accurate. If they were making rock star quality games, they could be more selective with Fallout, with Elder Scrolls and stuff. And I think people would be more understanding if you said, yeah, 
it's going to take us a while to get you Fallout 5, but when you get it, it's going to be the best game you've ever played. If they had that reputation, people would go along with it and be like, okay, well, just don't rush it. If anything, don't rush it. But now people are like, so I have to wait till 2020 or 2035 to get a Fallout game that probably isn't very good. Got it. <laughs> and I think people are just frustrated as hell with it. Now, I don't think that, you know, just giving a company like Obsidian the keys to the castle is necessarily the the panacea that some people think it would be. Obsidian has had kind of a rough go of it in the last handful of years. They've had, you know, some solid games that are like 8 out of 10s or 7 out of 10s, but they haven't really popped off and had one of those masterpieces. And... So I, I don't think that they are necessarily like going to just drop a 10 out of 10 the moment that they get handed the franchise, but at least it would be something. And as of right now, we're just, we're just stuck. I, I think if they were going to do something Fallout related, we would probably start to hear rumblings about it in the next year or so. I would guess they drop an announcement maybe next summer when we get a, a Amazon show season two um, drop. Maybe they announce just a cinematic trailer and they're like 2028 Fallout New Vegas 2 or something. Maybe they do that because if Phil has any interest in, in money, he would be calling everybody and setting that up because that just prints money. I mean, it would just be ridiculous. Uh, D1 Avalo, how well do you think Obsidian's Avowed will do? I think it's going to end up in the same like Outer Worlds realm. Probably for most people, it averages out to like an 8 out of 10. I don't think it's going to be a masterpiece. They've said it's smaller in scale. I think it'll be like a solid romp in the RPG hay, but it's not going to be anything like that will blow your mind. That's my guess, at least. He took my thing. Red, red, red.